Hello, friends. Welcome once again. Um, I think uh, before we get into the presentation, I must uh, thank uh, the NPTEL team. Uh, there might be a lot of people who might be working at the background, but uh, the people that I've been interacting with, uh, like Balaraju, Balaji, and Nikita, have been very kind and cooperative uh, in terms of enabling me to uh, come here and uh, share my views. So while uh, some of you might be thinking why I'm saying welcome back again, because uh, to me, it looks like uh, this has become like a uh, interview series, because if you look at uh, the topic, uh, there were two other sessions uh, that were done, one in, uh, in the month of April and one in May. The first topic was uh, what companies expect uh, while hiring a candidate. And the second one was on uh, why you should write your own resume right so today's topic uh, the reason why i picked this is uh, from the earlier two sessions when i look at uh, some of the questions that have come i can see some pattern uh, post the session when question and answers are happening or when i look at uh, the form where you fill the questions i see that most of you have asked about your nervousness when you are in the interview so I thought, why don't we pick this topic, right? So just like uh, always, I understand that we have different learners. So I have put together a presentation. So let me quickly bring that up. All right. And I hope uh, you are able to see the presentation. And um, OK. So. I just want to add one more point. Uh, some of you might be thinking whether this is even relevant in the current context because COVID hasn't ended and uh, what is happening to the job market, right? So when I read the headlines of Economic Times, I see a balance. What I mean by that is there are some companies which are adding jobs and there are some companies which are cutting jobs. So just in case, if your skill set matches to the requirement of where the companies are hiring, then I think uh, this will benefit you. And on the other hand, uh, it is just not the interview in an organization that you go to, but uh, there are a lot of other opportunities, like maybe some of you might be applying for a beauty contest, right? So there will be an interview. And some of you might be applying for a college, so there will be an interview. So this session might help you in those areas also and not just uh, when you apply for a job all right moving on uh, i have not included a slide about uh, my introduction but for those of you who have joined for the first time uh, work i work for capgemini in the hr space i have close to two decades of experience i am based out of hyderabad i have worked in india and a couple of european cities and core skill sets are around project management and service delivery, but very recently I moved into HR. All right, so what are we gonna do? So the flow of the lecture, the next uh, one hour or so, we are going to look at what exactly is this whole nervousness business. Then we will understand why exactly you feel it. Then, what does it feel like? How does it feel like? Then we will see when do you feel? And lastly, what can you do about it? So most of our lecture discussion will be around the last part because I guess some of it, you know it, but that is the area that uh, you all need to focus. Okay. All right. So just imagine this is you and you were informed that you have an upcoming interview. And if I come and ask you, okay, what is your state of mind? Then possibilities of you saying something like this are high. Some of you might say that, okay, I'm scared. And one might say I'm tensed or you are par paranoid or you are nervous, which is the topic of our discussion anyways. And some of you might say that I am feeling anxious or strained or worried or frightened there might be some more adjectives or the way you might want to express your state of mind right but 
if we have to really look at it, then what you're actually going through is a dash. Now, some of you who have that eye for detail might have realized there are some letters which are highlighted in red and are underlined, and you might have already formed it. So basically what you go through is stress. In other words, I, I can add something to it. I would also say fear, right? So it is the fear of the interview. While we are on this page, uh, I remember a video I have seen a couple of years back of a lady lying on the grass in a park and the camera pans out from her eye and just like Google uh, Maps, it zooms out and then it shows her lying in the park, then the park, then the city where the park is located, the country and eventually the earth. And when the camera goes into space, even the earth looks like a very small dot. So I just want you to think that the fear of interview that you have is as small and significant compared to the bigger things uh, in life, yeah? All right, so now that you defined that uh, it's nervousness, it's basically stress. Now let's see, why do you actually feel it, yeah? So, it is because of this little organ in our head, that 1.5 kg weighing organ called brain. There is a very famous, uh, there was a very famous uh, neuroscientist, uh, Paul McLean, and according to his uh, trained brain theory, he says that in our brain, there are three brains. So let's see what he's talking about. The first one is the primitive brain or the reptilian brain. This is the first ever that we have uh, acquired, right? And it lists somewhere there. I mean, brain is a complex organ. I might not be able to exactly point uh, towards where it is, but somewhere what it's shown here. The primary purpose of this brain is to keep us alive. And how it does is by ensuring that our heart rate is proper, by ensuring that we continuously breathe, and by ensuring that appropriate body temperature. And all of you are uh, adults on this lecture, and by now you must have realized that we cannot kill ourselves by holding our breath. I mean, you can, with practice, expand the period uh, to which you can hold it, but eventually you will give up because your body uh, just can't take that and you will start breathing. So that is this part of the brain which is forcing you because its job is to keep you alive. The second is the emotional brain or the limbic system. And it's in the somewhere middle, right? So this, uh, the purpose of this part of the brain is to keep us safe. All our emotions and memories and all are triggered from this part of the brain. Then the third, which is the newest, it's called the cortex or the executive brain where it keeps us smart. So that reason why we are different from animals is because of our language, the ability of our language, the imaginations, the abstract things that we can think in our mind, the thoughts, the thinking itself, and the creativity, right? Now, I have deliberately not touched upon the fight or flight response, which is highlighted in red here, which is from our limbic system, because I wanted to give you an example, and that is for that, I have to take you back to the caveman days. Here is our hero, our caveman, who is relaxing probably one afternoon after having a great uh, lunch. Looks like he has eaten an animal, a non-veg, because he's using the bone of that animal as a floss. And there comes a snake. So the moment he sees a snake, that is a threat detection. So what happens is this fight or flight response kicks in and either he will fight that creature or he will run away from there. So the reason why I am specifically talking about this is this has a lot of question, answers to our question as to why we feel when we go and sit for that interview or the thought of interview itself. So remember this fight or flight response, which is triggered because of our brain. Now, 
how does it actually feel? But before we get there, uh, let me just share uh, what has happened when I was preparing this presentation. So I kept the door of my balcony door open just to get some fresh air. And I could hear a big bee buzzing around. It entered the room and I almost fell from my chair. Though I was so engrossed in making that presentation, but the reptilian brain or the primitive brain and the limbic system was still so active that uh, it prepared me to fight that bee because it detected it as a threat. Because we no longer live in jungles like how we used to. The world has changed, but our, my, our mind uh, uh, still tries to keep us safe and thinks uh, that everything is a threat around us. You know? So how does it feel? Now, we'll have to look at a little bit of uh, physiological stuff here as well, because the bee buzzing, I was able to hear it with my ear. So anything sensory where you see a threat, our brain starts processing. What it does is it sends signals to different parts of the organ. So our eyes, uh, probably uh, the pupil will kind of dilate and uh, we sweat. Uh, breathing goes higher and our star heart starts to beat faster. Now, I'm sure when you think about interview, when you have attended one, probably you have gone through the same symptoms. So that is because of this physiological changes that the brain is trying to create in your body. And what happens is when you feel stress, the hormones get released in your body, in your bloodstreams. There are a lot of hormones, but I'll touch upon a very uh, famous one, which is known as cortisol. I'm sure by now all of you might be thinking that uh, this session, which should revolve around interviews, suddenly is trying to become like a biology class. But I can tell you that uh, this is the only slide where I'm going to use some biological terms. So stay with me. So this cortisol is a stress hormone which gets released into our body because it's trying to prepare us to either fight or to run. Right. You must have also heard from people that I perform better when I am in under pressure. So some studies have claimed that, yes, the longer the stress and if you plot a performance on the other axis, then, yes, there is some correlation that you might perform better. But as you can see, over a period of time, it drops. And what happens is you will become into that distress mode. Now, there are a lot of mechanisms as we go along, I'll explain, but because we are talking about hormone, there is another hormone called oxytocin, which is famously known as a cuddle hormone. So when you hug somebody, you release that in your body. That is also a stress hormone, but unfortunately, that doesn't stay in your body for a very long time. That is why it is difficult to be in a happy state all the time, but it is very much possible to be in a stressful state for a longer time because this cortisol remains in bloodstream for a longer period of time, even over an hour. So when you are going through stress, your normal blood cells needs, uh, uh, your healthy blood cell needs to be like this with a better opening so that it's easier for the blood to flow. But when you are under stress, it constrict and this is how it becomes. And this is not a good state to be in because the longer you stay in this, it is very dangerous for your overall well-being, your cardiovascular diseases. You will not be able to sleep in the night. Concentration goes for a toss and all that. Okay. All right. So now you know what it is. You know some of the changes. But let's look at the origins of stress. I mean, where exactly it comes from. Because... I have given you an example of cavemen. Universally, there are some threats our brain recognizes, the dangers or the pains that we have gone through when we evolved. So they are there and we can't do anything about it. Yeah, our brain is going, constantly going to protect us. Then as we became a part of our tribe, we formed societies. And when we started living with other people, probably there were opportunities for feeling embarrassed or getting rejected and it added up to our overall personality. Then some of it might be because of our personal own experiences, our previous failures or lack of our own self-control. 
these are some of the things which have added to why we feel stress in today's world. Let's look at some of the common ones. Maybe this is where you'll get a lot of clarity. And I want to start with a very uh, nice uh, quote from a Roman philosopher, Seneca, who says, we suffer more often in imagination than in reality. I'll repeat this. We suffer more often in imagination than in reality. And this picture truly depicts what Seneca is trying to say. It's we versus our own mind. It's like our own shadow that we are scared of. Now, in terms of interviews, I have thought about what could be potential statements or fears that you might come across. Fear of the unknown might fit here because you really don't know who the interviewer is going to be, right? Fear of being judged. Now, maybe you are not relevant or your skill set is not relevant to the job that you have applied for, but your friends might label you, you might judge, the, they might judge you and call you dumb or misfit. Fear of rejection. Maybe you didn't get selected or you might not get selected. Fear of attention. An interview is a one-on-one -on -one, uh, setting, so all eyes are on you and you are uncomfortable with that. Fear of incorrect answers, because you think that you know, but when you go there, because you are in that stress, you might give an incorrect answer. Fear of looking bad. Study-wise, you are absolutely fantastic, but the corporate world, the real life is different, and you might not uh, come out as a strong a student you were in terms of an employee. Fear of not recollecting answers. This also happens. When I used to take interviews, I have seen uh, students, especially who don't have experience, just uh, looking upstairs, scratching their head and trying to recollect answers. Fear of struggle. Because interview itself might be a very uncomfortable setting and you are not liking that. Fear of change is another one because you are transitioning from a campus to a corporate, so that change might be a little difficult to accept. Fear of uncertainty. I mean, you have probably applied for it and it takes some time for them to come back and tell you whether you're selected or not. So you might be not comfortable being in that state. And lastly, fear of messing it up. You yourself feel that, okay, I think I'm not going to do a good job. Yeah. So while we are talking about uh, fear, I think uh, I want to share one of my fear. It has nothing to do with uh, the interview uh, as such. But uh, when I was a kid, I dreaded going closer to water, a pool of water, even a swimming pool or a well. Because my parents had told me that uh, one of my cousins uh, died because of drowning. Uh, and one summer, I was with my other cousins and they threw me into water for fun. And I didn't know how to swim, but they were expert swimmers. So eventually they saved me, but uh, the kind of fear I had in my mind, I was unable to learn swimming for a very long time. And when I was staying in London, there was a gym right across my apartment. And every day I used to see that gym and a big board saying swimming. There's a swimming pool inside the gym. And after a lot of thinking, I decided that, okay, I need to overcome this fear. And I went and enrolled uh, into the gym and slowly started to step into water. And eventually in a couple of months, I learned how to swim on the surface. But I can tell you that it is only 50% of my fear of water has gone. The other 50% still remains. And I can tell you that because last year when we went to Andaman with our colleagues, all my colleagues were enjoying the scuba diving. But uh, I, even after wearing a scuba suit, I went and I had to come back unsuccessful not doing it because I could not control my heavy breathing. So I'm still dealing with that fear. So if you have any kind of fear, it is very natural. But we will talk about how you can address it in subsequent slides. So this is what you need to first start doing it. From that person, you have to become this person, put on that boxing glove, and probably your fear 
as you have seen in my example, it's so, so sticky, it will also try and fight you back. But you have to come out as a winner. All right, now let us also look at what all scenarios or when do you feel it? There are few people who are responsible for it and we'll just go through it because all of us come from different backgrounds. All of us have different experiences. We have lived in different environments, right? So maybe some of it, what we are talking might not be applicable to you, but in majority, we have seen that this is uh, relevant to many. So the first is parents. So they were your first caretakers. You have grown up with them in a very controlled environment. And if your parents did not allow you to fail, and learn from it. Or if they were overprotective and they were very pampering, or they wanted perfection from you, then chances are that it has somewhere impacted you as an overall person, and that resulted in a lower self-confidence. Now, I'm not saying that you go back and blame your parents, because uh, whatever they had at that point in time in that space they did what they could the second important figure is your teachers or your professors just in case if you were a party to an event or an incident where they probably did not uh, give attention to you or there was lack of encouragement or inappropriate evaluation or sometimes if they have said something like, okay, you are good for nothing, you will never get a job, you will not be successful in your life, you actually took it on the face value of what was said because you fall, fell prey to what we call expert fallacy. Because a teacher or a professor is an authority figure and uh, you consider them as expert and you started to believe that maybe you don't have it in you and it affected your overall self-esteem and self-confidence. Then comes the other important part of our lives, which, are, which is our friends, and uh, consciously have put uh, working in there because probably these guys are uh, older to you and have already gone through that process of interview, and maybe they are trying to show some superiority over you and uh, say that, okay, interviews are tough or you got to do this and that and all that stuff. And because you trust your friends and there is uh, something called social learning and the people that you trust, you learn through their experience as well. And if we have to remove others from the equation and put the spotlight back on you, then you are also responsible for uh, having that fear of interviews. Maybe because if you saw some program, some TV or movie, any clip where they show that uh, uh, the protagonist or the main character or anybody for that matter is scared, then probably you kind of process it like that. Or when you read some literature, maybe a news magazine or wherever, and if you have paid attention to the struggle, the person or the character going through the interviews, you started to form that. You didn't realize at that point in time but certain beliefs and perceptions started forming in your brain because your brain doesn't keep quiet. While I'm talking to you, I th think there are so many other thoughts which are going on in my mind. So we have a higher self and a lower self. Our higher self is all about the curiosity part, the learning mindset. And our lower self is all about self-doubt and low confidence. So when these things happened in your life, probably your slower self was fed more than your higher self. All right, so what can you do about it? As I said, those were just a little background of giving you a context that if you are having that fear or if you feel nervous or stressed, it's absolutely natural because that is how we have been. It is to protect you. But being in that state for a longer time also is not good because you're going to lose out on a lot. 
So now we will concentrate on what is it that you can do about it. So the first and foremost is you have to open the door of your brain. And if you have been saying any statement similar to what you see here, that is procrastinating or having a self-doubt or focusing on things which are not in your control, then you are actually within the comfortable zone. So our brain doesn't want us to work harder, simple. It just wants us to feel safe and it will avoid you from getting into any situation where it has to work harder. So to give you an example of a comfort zone, if you are one of them who don't want to sit in the front seat in the class, or if you are one of them who, are, who is scared to raise a hand and ask a question in the class, though you so much want to know the answer, then you are in that comfort zone. And success and growth is when you push that comfort zone. It's, the, it's towards the edges. And you, when you do that, your language changes to something like this. Or you will have to start using a language like this. And I'll just remain for some seconds here. Just see the contrast between these two sentences. And this is still happening in your mind, in your head. Because your brain says that you are the one who has been telling me all these years. And just because of that, I have acted the way I, I acted. So when you push your comfort zone, when you move there, it is called the opportunity zone. And here I can help you with another personal story of my life. So when I moved to Amsterdam uh, for two years and... Uh, just like my other Indian colleagues, I had a choice to hang around with the same set of people, that is the Indians, because it's so much easier. Culturally, I know them. Our eating habits are similar. And probably we speak in the regional language or Hindi for that matter. And I don't have to literally push my comfort zone and I'm very comfortable with them. Or I had a choice to go and speak to other expatriates who came from different parts of the world and are living there. And believe me, I chose the second. And when I did that, today I have some beautiful and meaningful friendships with few Europeans. If I would have decided to stay back, I would have missed out on this opportunity. So the magic happens when you push that comfort zone. All right. There might be some uh, techies uh, on this uh, lecture when, uh, while you program uh, the computer, but you can also program your mind. So what I mean by that is uh, just have a look at this. Uh, this mind is uh, full of uh, rust. And uh, this is something like your old mind, old brain. Before you came for this session, probably this is how your brain was. It was rigid and it needs some oiling. And it is a repository of some learned experiences. What I have just shown you, the parents, the teachers, the friends, your own reading or exposure. And it is habitual. You go back and do the same stuff over and over again. You fear about interviews. You keep on fearing about interviews. But how does your new brain look like? Your br new brain uh, looks something like this. So we have 80 billion neurons in our head. I'm sorry, again, I, I, I kind of came back to using some biological terms, but our brain is very elastic. And as the neuroscientist says, neurons that fire together, wire together. So in this picture, as you can see, these two neurons are firing together because you have new thoughts, new positive thoughts, and you are creating those uh, the neurotransmitters and that impulses are happening, the current and all that stuff, you're doing it. And the moment you want to, you decide to unlearn your old habits, you lose it. So this is, if you don't use it, you will lose it. So our mind, our brain is that flexible. 
So now you must be thinking, okay, this is fine, but how do I actually reprogram it? It's a simple three steps to reprogram your fears. The first one is you have to name the fear. So if I take you back to this, you have to pick. There is a possibility that all of you on the call might not be uh, feeling all the fears together. There might be one, two, or a couple of them. So choose that one. Then come back and replace that with a new thought. Now what you have seen, the comfort zone, the opportunity zone, so you will have to think about a new thought because that is where a new neuron gets formed. And then take action. And this needs to get repeated every time you want to become a better person. Okay, it's as simple as this. Now, you need to take actions. Now, what happens if you don't take action is explained uh, through this slide. Let's say you have a self-doubt. You're always thinking about the doubt in your mind, whether I'll be able to do a good job at the interview. Do, uh, am I confident enough? Am I wor worthy enough? And all that stuff. This leads to thinking action and reinforces only self-doubt. But whereas the winners are the, are the people who have a targeted stuff in their mind and they have planned activities and those activities will become a plan and then it endorses further action. So in either way, it is a loop. So the choice you have to make, you want to be just a thinker or you are somebody who, want, who needs to be doing things. Okay. All right. So now comes the important part of so far you have known the background of everything but now you are ready for that interview that you need to attend so there is some amount of homework that you have to do so i'll tell you what you can do before the interview on the day of interview and then after the interview so before the interview please pay attention to the job description so if you have observed or if you have been to in the last session why you should write your own resume i have mentioned the job description and why it is so important you have to be thorough with a job description because that is when you will understand what the job is and your confidence level will go up then basis the job description you have to create your resume now for every job there can be a separate resume if you want to know more you can attend that uh, lecture then you need to do some uh, research on the company that you're applying for and this was covered in the first lecture what companies expect while hiring candidates it has a detailed uh, uh, points about how you can go about uh, researching about an organization and the interview format because some interviews are telephonic, some are video conferencing, and some are face-to-face. -face. So just in case, if it is not face-to-face, -face, and if it is a video conference, then you need to take care of certain logistics by make, ensuring that you, are, you have identified a spot which is uh, uh, not uh, noisy and you have a better internet connection so that you avoid getting into that stress where the interviewer is unable to hear you properly. Interview location is also another important thing. Uh, maybe they might not allow you to get inside the building, but I would suggest one day before just to go and uh, just get yourself familiarized where, where exactly this building is, because your brain the next day will identify that as something very familiar. So it doesn't pose any threat because uncertainty is something that our brain doesn't like, right? And the last bit is your interviewer. Because if you know the interviewer name in advance, you can do some research of by going on LinkedIn and knowing a thing or two about him or her. But also be prepared, there might be more than one interviewer. And you also need to be prepared that the interviewer might have not read your resume in the first place. The interviewer might be getting distracted. The interviewer might not be interested in your answers. So you might come across any kind of interviewer. So if you go there, 
thinking that everything is going to be hunky dory then probably you have not uh, prepared your brain to process these uncertainties that can happen okay so this is some of the homework that you have to do uh, when you before you go for an interview the day of an interview so what happens on the day of the interview is again your senses process a lot visually you will see the interviewer who might be older than you and uh, that expert thing or the authority figure might intimidate you then when they speak probably they speak in a authoritative voice because they are more relaxed they don't have to give an answer they have to ask questions right so it might add up to your nervousness then the words and sentences they use when they are interacting with you might be polished and very professional and lastly their body language because they are very much in control of themselves it uh, kind of shows up in their body language and when you go there and you sit and you observe all of this chances are that maybe your fear comes back or you may start to feel a lot of more stress so before you actually go and sit in front of that person there are some very easy steps that you can follow one is pause let's say you are sitting in the waiting room before entering that door pause because there are some running thoughts and there are some thoughts which you force and you think so take a pause and breathe this is very important because our body needs that oxygen and i'll tell you what happens when you do these uh, three simple steps and third is you have to label what you are feeling at that point in time because in the first when your heart is racing and all that stuff it is basically that uh, part of the brain which is responsible to keep you safe and alive get, is getting a lot of blood flow and your prefrontal cortex which is the thinking one is sleeping very nicely but the moment you label what are you feeling at that point in time then you suddenly wake the prefrontal cortex and it lets you calm down and then you will be able to remember all the answers that you have prepared yourself for you will be in far better control of yourself because physiologically you are not letting your body react differently believe me when i got exposed to this and i have used it in my personal life it has created an impact and don't think that by doing this overnight you will become a uh, calmer of stormer kind of stuff no it will not happen because our brain though it is elastic it needs a lot of hard work it needs repetition it needs to learn right but somewhere you have to start so do this every time you before entering the interview room and last after the interview many people think that okay if i kind of go until the interview that is the job is done i can come back happily and just leave it but the successful people are those who ponder upon what has happened after the interview so what you have to do is first you have to confidently walk out of that room the way you have confidently walked into the room because that is where it starts then you have to take out some me time quietly you have to sit and revisit what has happened in the interview because of our busy lives we might get busy in other things in our life and we miss this good opportunity to reflect on a very recent experience that you have seen which will help you in your future so take that time and then think how did i do back there what questions did i struggle to answer 
and what answers the interviewer gave me when I asked them questions before the interview ended. So these are some of the questions that you need to ask. And if you have a habit of writing or if you maintain a journal, then probably it's a good idea to write it because our memory is another crazy phenomena. So if you write it next time when you go for an interview, probably you'll refer and then it might help. And lastly, if you were to give the same interview again, what is it that you're going to do differently? When you ask these questions, believe me, next time when you go there and sit, you will be a changed person. So uh, while we, we are talking about this, uh, uh, Zen saying comes to my mind uh, wherein they say that uh, you can't see your reflection in a running water, but can be seen only in still water. So unless you take that time out and analyze, you will not be able to see your own performance, how you did it. All right, so I conclude, I think uh, we have yeah, 20 more minutes. So I conclude by this uh, very nice uh, quote or analogy or whatever you want to call it. Fear has two meanings. If you literally break down F-E-A-R, the first one is forget everything and run. It is basically the flight, our cavemen just running, looking at the snake. Or face everything and rise. So this is the fight part. At the end, choice is yours. Okay. All right. So that was the last slide I had put together and I'm sure there are some uh, question and answer. We will see what uh, questions have come. Let me just uh, open that. And I am going to pick only relevant ones. Uh, please don't mind if you don't uh, uh, see me picking the question that you have asked. But uh, some, some of you who have uh, been on uh, my lectures in the past, I know it already that I take some time, but I respond to all relevant questions. All right. So, okay. So, Lokesh uh, from Andhra Pradesh asked, uh, while appearing in the interviews, I feel anxious and fear. I think, Lokesh, we have gone through the whole exercise and I hope you got some answers. All right. Uh, Rupanya is saying, how to talk with confidence if I don't, don't know the answer for the question asked? Okay, so Rupanya, either you know the answer, you don't. So in this case, if you don't know the answer, if you make up an answer, then the interviewer is going to know that you are trying to make up an answer. I think the best thing is uh, to be honest and uh, say that, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer. Or if that is a, not a relevant thing that you have studied or had an experience on, you can say that uh, I did not come across that. Okay. Manoj from Bilai is asking, if nervousness is not due to language or lack of knowledge based on what could be the remedy for it. Okay, so if I understand the correct question correctly, you're saying that uh, maybe language has become an hindrance because of which you are not having that confidence. So as I said, if you already know, then what is stopping you from working on it? Right? All right. I'm just, uh, okay. Sahu from Katak says, how to clear my nervousness? I think uh, I have touched upon it and I hope probably you put, have put this question uh, at the time when we st uh, didn't start the session, and I hope you got some clarity. <laughs> okay, this is an interesting question from Mani Kandar Prabhu. When interview is scheduled at afternoon, we look so tired at that time. How to come, overcome that tiredness? <laughs> well, yes, good point, and I think I completely forgot, but uh, uh, beside your mental uh, well-being, uh, your physical stuff needs to be taken care of. And uh, I think you need to avoid any fatty food or uh, colas and all that stuff before you go for an interview. And uh, don't eat so much that uh, you feel uh, sleepy in the afternoon and dress appropriately, feel good. 
Uh, and I think uh, that should uh, take care of it because you really don't have control over when exactly the company is going to call you. Right. Okay. All right. Vijaya from uh, Karnul is asking, how should be my mindset before facing the interview? Good question. I think I should have reflected that. You have to go with an open mind. And you have to look at interview as an experience, as an opportunity to learn. If you go to an interview thinking that I need that job, I want to crack that interview, then I think that is a very fixed mindset because either this or that. Whereas the growth mindset is when you go with an open mind and even if you don't make it, you are going to learn something out of it. Like the after the interview exercise that I spoke about, if you concentrate on that, then you will not feel a lot nervous when you go and sit for that interview. Okay. <laughs> Bhavya Bharati from Ongol is asking how to hide fear. <laughs> okay, so let me tell you uh, the celebrities that you see who are so confident when they come on stage or in front of the screen, they are so confident. But you really don't know what they are going through. And I have uh, an example here. So there is this uh, British library in Hyderabad. So I was a member. Once I went and there was some uh, program going on and uh, they wanted some volunteers and there were like 20 people sitting and they divided them into groups of uh, four and uh, said, okay, choose a leader among yourself. First introduce to each other, choose a leader among yourself. And this leader is supposed to come here and kind of tell about the all other people. And I don't know, my group chose me and I was concentrating in listening to everybody's introduction and trying to mentally remember. When I went there, I did an okay job. But when I came back, I, there was a very elder person and I told him, sir, I don't know why, but uh, uh, my heart was pounding and uh, um, I was uh, breathing uh, faster. Uh, were you able to see that uh, uh, fear on my face? He said, uh, well, uh, you spoke a lot faster. I mean, I couldn't see it on your face, but when you spoke faster, I could feel that, okay, you are nervous. Then immediately after that, a 20-year-old, half my age person goes there and very confidently introduces the rest of his uh, group. And I looked at this sir and I said, I think I need to learn something from this guy. Then he said to me, the old person told me, you don't know what he was going through when he was standing there. So all of us have some amount of fear. Some people have mastered it, but the only way Bhavya Bharati is to push yourself and there will, there will be a point, even when you are feeling the fear, it will not show up on your face. So maybe if you're looking at me now, you might think that, okay, I don't have a fear of going live without uh, having retakes. But uh, this has happened because this is my third session, right? So try and eventually you will uh, handle it. And if you paid attention to the topic of uh, this lecture, I did not say overcome nervousness or eliminate nervousness because it's not going to happen. You can only handle your stress and nervousness. Because you have seen that it's a physiological phenomena. I mean, our bodies, our mind needs to, brain needs to keep us alive and keep us safe. So we are going to feel stress in a lot of situation. It's just not interview, but a lot of places. So, I mean, uh, just look at some of your friends. Uh, some of them uh, feel uh, very uh, good when they sit on a roller coaster because they process in their mind and they feel that experience as exciting. But some of your friends might be very scared about that because uh, they think that uh, it is very scary. So it's how you look at an activity, uh, actually the stress uh, hormone gets released in your body. 
All right, I'm just uh, going through. Okay, there are a lot of questions here which are um, related to my previous topics, but uh, don't worry, I'll still answer them uh, maybe in a week or 10 days. I'm trying to look for the ones which are relevant to our topic. Ha. Huh. Swati from Bangalore says, I'm not nervous during interview, but I feel I'm fast. That's what other makes other people think that I'm nervous. So as I uh, told you, Swati, about my own experience, uh, yes, journal perception is somebody is speaking faster, maybe they are nervous. But it doesn't matter. I think in that interview, they are not evaluating you whether you are nervous or not. And I don't know if you have come across an interviewer who is asking this first question when you come and sit, are you nervous? I, I do that when I come across, especially a fresher or somebody with less amount of experience person, I try and do a little talk just to kind of bring down their nervousness level. So in an interview evaluation form that I have seen, be it in my current company or the previous companies that I have worked for, nobody gives you a, a good mark or a higher mark for not being nervous. So I think that's fine. Ah, okay. Ritu Parna from Gwalia says, how to keep calm and composed during an interview with keeping in mind this is the last chance to crack into a company. Okay, Ritu Parna, as I was saying, the fixed mindset and the growth mindset. If you feel that, okay, this is your last chance, then you have to work a lot more harder. So be it your resume, be it the job description, the company's profile or potential questions, do a full thorough research and maybe that will help you. Okay. All right. Okay. Maybe from Ranchi says, uh, that's face sweating give a bad impression on the interviewer. <laughs> okay. See, right now I am also sweating because uh, I didn't switch on the AC because it creates a lot of uh, noise. But uh, I don't think so. It creates a bad impression because uh, as long as the interviewer is uh, a little matured and feel that our uh, biological makeups are different and some people naturally sweat a lot and some don't, so it doesn't matter. Okay. All right. Okay, there are so many questions here. Ah, this is an interesting question from Siddhant from Gujarat. What type of personality traits and body language are expected by an uh, interviewer? Okay, so personality types, you know, again, if I bring in my psychology uh, studies, then uh, there are different types and an interview form doesn't uh, ask, okay, whether that person is uh, fitting into any of those. Nobody uh, has uh, that kind of a form, but I can touch upon the body language part. So in terms of the body language, so some of the common things that they see is your posture. I mean, first is when you walk into the interview room, how do you walk in? I mean, you walk in confidently or you are timid and you kind of lean forward and then you walk in. And when you sit, you, are you sitting upright, straight shoulders and with your head held high, not looking at the ceiling and uh, not uh, looking down, but straight and having a proper eye contact uh, with the interviewer. And especially when you are leaving, or when you are shaking hands. I mean, in the COVID uh, days now, it's uh, no more handshaking, but uh, when it was allowed, then uh, how firmly you shake hands. Because when I take interviews, I kind of uh, understand the state of mind of the other person by just shaking the hands. So the low confident people might not give the full hand, but they'll just give like, just a half palm it's called and there are some who are dominating will uh, 
kind of uh, squeeze your hand so that it hurts. So there are different types of handshakes. Probably you can do a little research on uh, body language and focus on the handshake in different uh, areas of body language. All right. OK, so Vivekananda from Chennai is asking how to handle nervous person attending first time like in stage presentation attending exam. So I believe uh, you are asking for a second person. You're not asking for yourself, maybe for a student who you are trying to put it in front of the stage. OK, interesting question. And I think uh, I can share my own experience when I was in my 10th grade. Uh, my principal, someone that I I love a lot. He is no more. But uh, one person that I admire a lot uh, is uh, my principal. And he gave me an opportunity to uh, speak, uh, especially in English, in front of uh, the parents and everybody uh, on the annual day celebration of our school. And if I recall, he did not scare me by telling me that, uh, the entire school's uh, image is in your hands. If you don't do a good job, then it is going to bring bad name to our school. There is an education minister there. There are chief guests and all that stuff. He didn't say any of those things. He just gave me direction that, OK, this is the script. He didn't allow me to think about because at that point in time, I was not even a smart person, I think. So he told me that, OK, these are the points that you need to cover. And uh, he told me, do this, read it, come to me, and read it out to me, and I will correct wherever you are going wrong. And he has shown an immense confidence in me that I'll be able to do that job. And I did that. So I think that is what we need to do. Instead of looking at and uh, making that person more fearful, concentrate on the good things and encourage that person. OK, we have four more minutes left. Let me see if I find any other. Uh, question. OK, there's another for body language, but we have covered. OK. All right, somebody is asking me if I can share this uh, PPT. Yes, whoever has asked the question, if there is an email ID proper here. Then after the session, I do share it. All right. OK, somebody says, I'm scared in interview. Give me advice. I think you have heard a lot of advice on this session. OK, and uh, Nawaz Sharif is asking from Kudalore, what are techniques for relaxation and boosting confidence? Good question, and whatever I have shared is from my experience or the areas that I got exposed to. But there might be a lot more. I was speaking to one of my friends, and she said uh, some uh, tapping. I think uh, the neuro-linguistic programming, there is some method. So there are various ways. I mean, few people do meditation to calm their body. So whatever works for you. I think the first thing is for you to explore what is out there and then trying it. And if you feel that, yes, this is helping me, then continue that. It has to be like that. All right. OK, I see a lot of uh, repetitions. OK, Nilesh Saha from Kolkata is asking, how to face uh, a tricky question which you don't have no i think you're, you're trying to ask that uh, how to face a tricky question that you don't have an answer for right so first thing is if you feel it's a little tricky there is no harm in asking that person to repeat the question or say it in a different way See, this is where your confidence comes into picture. If you go there thinking that, OK, you are uh, somebody who is lower compared to the person who is taking an interview, you are putting a lot of emphasis on the interviewer. You are not focusing on yourself. You have to bring the spotlight on you. 
So you have to take control of that interview. And if you think that's a tricky question, go back and ask. I'm sorry, but uh, can you repeat that question? Be polite in asking and be assertive and they will like it. And they might think that, okay, probably the way they have asked, maybe they uh, are not clear in their own question. So they will repeat it and you might understand it. And if you don't know an answer, be honest and say that I'm, I don't know an answer. Believe me, interviewers appreciate the interviewee agreeing and admitting that they don't know an answer than somebody who's trying to make up and going round and round and round you know so okay i think uh, there are some repetitive questions but uh, as i said i will uh, come back to the ones that i was unable to answer uh, on this lecture so uh, once again uh, thank you uh, for joining this uh, lecture and uh, whatever is your fear not able to speak proper english or having some fears from the past all of us have the power to overcome it so i wish that this session has given you some ammunition with which you go back and implement that into your respective lives and come out as a winner. Thank you and take care.